Gary must at least have some sort of uh, impression that I wouldn't read all that was written down here, and that I might say something different. <clears throat> he said he'd like for me to say more than a few sentences, and he doesn't want me to say, here's Gary. <laughs> so I won't do that. Uh, I might uh, add that his topic tonight, Contend for the Faith, there is a paper I recall that has a very similar title, Contend for the Faith. And you're talking about uh, free, buddy? It pained me a great deal. <clears throat> but uh, David and I elected to make the paper free. <laughs> oh, that hurt. <laughs> But if anyone wants the paper, it's very simple to do. Just go to cftfpaper.com, and you can sign up. Actually, you can go to that site without signing up and access the paper at any time. And, and the issue is going back to 2004, I believe it is. But that's not the uh, focus of my comments tonight. It's about one Gary Summers who will be preaching to us on contend for the faith. He's uh, completed 40 years of preaching in uh, June of last year, or 2012. It's hard to believe someone that looks as young as he does, but it's true. And he and his wife Barbara had been have been married for 48 years, and most of them have been happy. <clears throat> Two children and four grandchildren, and he has a, a you know a, a list of academic accomplishments, and he's written some uh, a lot of material. And, and I, I, you're talking about free, you know, he also puts out a paper called uh, Spiritual Perspectives, and you can get that free. You go to the www.spiritualperspectives.org. And it's a very well-written paper, as I would suggest that to you uh, highly. One thing he didn't put down is that he, he he's preaching. He preaches for the South Seminole Congregation in Winter Haven, Florida. What? Winter Park? In Winter Park. So it's not a haven then, is it? It just parks there. Okay. Anyway, he's uh, been preaching there for 11 years, is that right? 11th year. Just amazing. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, he's doing a, a fine job there, and we appreciate having him here. We've used him before to do editing and what have you, and he does a fine job on proofreading. In fact, I, I would, uh, <clears throat> wouldn't mind you doing that some more. Uh, but anyway, he's going to speak on to, uh, to us about it. But, uh, contend for the faith. You come speak to us. Well, it's always a joy to be here and uh, be given topics that uh, over the years have been quite vital. And uh, this year's is uh, certainly no exception to that. Entire books have been written with the title contend for the faith, some even by denominationalists. And uh, as was mentioned, there's a rather prominent magazine called Contending for the Faith, not to mention several years of lectures <coughs> here. One wonders, what more can you say uh, <laughs> with all that has been written? But uh, we'll try to find a few things. Among the churches of Christ, one of the most well-known verses in the New Testament is Jude, verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write unto you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. That verse assumes that Christians know what the faith is, what truth is. And uh, even though we're not primarily discussing verses 1 and 2 tonight, it is clear that this is not written specifically to elders. It's not written 
specifically to preachers, and I think maybe some have gotten the idea that it is, but uh, he addresses them as beloved, and he is talking to all of the Christians who are receiving this letter, those who are called, those who have been sanctified. So this is not something for a certain segment, uh, not that preachers don't have a responsibility to contend, and, and certainly not that elders don't have that responsibility, but all have that responsibility. And Jude 3 urges brethren to take action of being able to contend for the faith. Peter enjoyed upon, enjoined upon all Christians giving a defense of the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear to give a, a defense of all of those who act, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. We ought also to be able to explain why we believe. That is the fulfilled prophecies concerning Christ, the miracles that he did, the evidence that we have in the Old and in the New Testament. Jude takes this a step further by exhorting us to be prepared to make an attack against error. Since Paul portrays us as soldiers, and as we just sang, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, it only makes sense that we know how to both assault false doctrine and defend the truth. And we'd like to begin with some definitions in Jude 3, looking at some of the key words in the passage. According to Thayer, the word translated diligence, he was giving all diligence to write unto them, means haste, then earnestness and diligence with a comment that it refers to earnestness in accomplishing, promoting, or striving after anything. In other words, it is not a task to approach in a half-hearted manner. Jude was not just to determine to cover his intended subject with care. He was doing so with all diligence. And a Christian must give all diligence to many things if he is going to remain faithful to the Lord. Peter uses this same concept as he talks about adding to one's faith virtue and the other qualities that follow in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7. A Christian cannot be lazy, apathetic, or have a self-serving heart, but rather we are to be diligent in what we do for God. The salvation that we have in Christ is something that we all share. The Greek word translated common, the common salvation, is not unlike our English word in that it may refer to something low or common, as in Acts 10, 14, and 28, and 11, 8, or uh, even something that is ceremonially impure or defiled. Mark 7, 2, Romans 14, 14. But it also refers to things that are shared as in the early church. Now all who believed at, were together and had all things in common, Acts 2 and verse 44. Paul also spoke of the common faith that all Christians have in Titus chapter 1 and verse 4. Thus, Jude's original intention was to exercise all diligence into writing to the brethren of the salvation that we all share in common. But something happened that made it necessary for him to change his plans. Presumably, he heard of a problem that had to be dealt with effectively immediately. The blessings of the great salvation that we all experience together would have to wait until another day. It was necessary that action be taken right away in another area. Thayer defines the Greek word as meaning necessity imposed either by the external condition of things or by the law of duty. It is the word the writer of Hebrews used in chapter 7, verse 12, when he pointed out that Jesus could not be a priest under the Old Testament law of Moses. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, 
there is also a change of the law. Now the current situation that Jude found compelled him, made it necessary for him to write what he was now about to write instead of what he had intended to write. He found it necessary to exhort members of the church. The Greek word means literally to call to one side and frequently is translated comfort as in Matthew 5 Four, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. But it can also mean beseech, strengthen, encourage, exhort. It is the same word used of Peter when he testified and exhorted those on Pentecost to obey the gospel. The central and key word, however, in Jude 3, and usually I don't deal a whole lot with the Greek. I leave that to Daniel. Uh, <laughs> because he's good at it. Uh, but the Greek word is epagonizomai, and it appears only here in the Greek New Testament. However, the word is formed from the preposition epi and agonizomai, and you recognize that as our English word, agony, as coming from that. The Greek does not contain a separate word translated earnestly. We're used to earnestly contend or contend earnestly. The word earnestly, there's, there's not a separate word for that. Both contend and earnestly translate epagonizomai. The King James, the New King James, the American Standard, and the New American Standard, arguably the four best translations, have both words. The NIV, the RSV, and the ESV, the English Standard Version, have contend without the word earnestly. Apart from the preposition epi, the word agonizomai has two related forms. The noun appears six times in the New Testament and is translated race in Hebrews 12, 1, run the race that is before us, conflict in three verses, and fight in 1 Timothy 6, 12, as in fight, the good fight of faith. Uh, and 2 Timothy chapter 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. Both noun and verb uh, are in those verses, both noun forms and verb forms. The other five times the verb form is used, it is translated strive, striving, uh, fight, and competes, and laboring. Those are some of the ways in which that word is translated. All of these, no matter which fits the context, all of these require a tremendous amount of energy. And we need to have that concept in mind as we think of contend earnestly. Have a tremendous amount of energy involved in doing that. A third related word is also a noun, and it is only found once in Luke 22 and verse 44, where agonia appears uh, most like our English word, agonia, agony, and is so translated and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Does that sound like something that is requiring a lot of control and energy being put into what is going on? The intensity of the idea? That's the word that we find in Jude 3, translated contend earnestly. The kind of struggle that Jesus experienced was one of the agony of the soul. The purpose for considering these words is to firmly embed in our minds the various nuances that the Greek words convey. Jude, however, puts the preposition epi in front of the verb form, and this addition will modify the word in some aspect. According to Vine, the word earnestly is added to convey the intensive force of the preposition. Not only are Christians supposed to fight, they are to fight in earnest. 
not as if they have no stake in the outcome. Our reward depends on the effort that we put forth to keep this command. Now let's talk about the faith for a moment. Quite frequently when we see the word faith in the scriptures, we are thinking of an individual's personal faith and the word is used in that sense frequently. In Jude 3, however, we are to contend earnestly for the faith, which does not refer to one's personal faith, but to the entirety of New Testament teaching. In other words, the whole Christian system. A few passages that illustrate that usage and which might be familiar are a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith, Acts 6, 7. But Elymas, the sorcerer, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith, Acts 13, 8. So the churches were strengthened in uh, the, the faith and increased in number daily, Acts 16, 5. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. But they were hearing only he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith, which he once tried to destroy, Galatians 1, 23. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to uh, deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy 4.1. So clearly, the faith often refers to uh, the whole body of New Testament teaching. And this phrase is used interchangeably with several other descriptions. For example, in Acts 13 alone, Sergius Paulus sought to hear the word of God, but Elymas attempted to turn him away from the faith. The word of God is interchangeable with the faith in that passage, which is also referred to as the straight ways of the Lord and the teaching or doctrine of the Lord. We know that Paul preached the faith, which means it must also be interchangeable with the gospel because we know Paul preached the gospel everywhere that he went, unashamedly. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. So obviously, the faith is also the truth, since one can go astray of either. Thus, to contend earnestly for the faith is to fight, to strive for Christianity as defined by its teachings in the New Testament. Now let's talk just for a moment about the phrase, once for all. Although the King James says that the faith was once delivered to the faint, uh, saints, uh, more modern translations translate the Greek word hapax as once for all. For example, the New King James, the American Standard, the New American Standard, the English Standard, the NIV, the RSB, they all chose to translate it once for all. But it is the context that must determine the translation. In the other 14 times that word is used in the New Testament, it's only translated once. Never once is the, and the other 14 times is it translated once for all. But the translators must have uh, all come to the conclusion, and uh, probably independently, that once for all is the best rendering in Jude 3. God has given us all the instructions that we need. He does not intend to send more revelation or make another covenant of Jesus Christ. He delivered all that is necessary to the saints. Jude 3 uh, basically says this, 2 Peter 1, 3, also discredits many people, such as Joseph Smith and all of his revelations. They annul ahead of time not only all those Mormon leaders who had claimed to have continued divine revelation and inspiration, these verses also reject all others who speak a vision of their own heart not 
from the mouth of the Lord, as Jeremiah 23 and verse 16 would put it. That would include the following. And some of these you may have heard of and some you may not have. That includes Moses David Berg, leader of the children of God, who wrote Mo letters to his followers. And these were supposed to be inspired. That includes Sun Myung Moon, author of Divine Principle, whose followers were called Moonies. That includes Jim Jones, who claimed... He didn't have any problem with ego. He claimed that he was the spirit of Christ, Buddha, and Lenin. I don't know how Lenin got in there. But he was inspired, as you may know, to lead more than 900 followers to their deaths in Guyana. The writings of Ellen G. White, Mary Baker Eddy, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, are the final authority for all their followers. All of these may say that they believe in and follow the Bible, but they will take the word of their cult leader or their organization anytime a conflict between this and it occurs. Pentecostals purportedly receive new revelations every day. Why do they need the scriptures at all? All of these religious groups put themselves at odds with the teaching of the New Testament, which was once for all delivered to the saints. And it is exactly against that type of error which we must contend. We are the ones who must fight against that. And as you see, our, our job is large because there's a large segment of the religious world who believes that they're still getting revelation and therefore that this is not complete. But it says it is. And that's something we must contend for. How interesting that the same verse that requires fighting for the faith is the one that also denies future revelations. But now let's talk about the context of Jude now that we've looked at the main words in verse 3. What problem was Jude addressing? He does not mention a ringleader, nor does uh, he mention how many there might be that are following a ringleader or more than one. Is he talking about the Gnostics here? Is he talking about the teaching that they had that since all flesh is sinful anyway, it really does not matter what we do with our physical bodies, so long as our spirits are pure. If the cause of their departure was prompted by some other teaching than the Gnostics, the result was the same. So we may or may not suspect that he was talking about Gnosticism, but whether he was or was not is irrelevant with respect to this. The result was the same. They were teaching that immorality was okay for Christians to engage in. And that they could engage in immoral activities with impunity. Now, Calvin may have never intended the following to occur. But his followers have adopted a tenet that has the same effect as Gnosticism. If all mankind is depraved, as Calvin taught, then anyone saved will be saved solely by the grace of God, not by anything that he does, not even having faith. In fact, he can't have faith unless God lets him have faith. So all of a person's sins, they claim, are forgiven at the point of faith, which God has to give him. And once an individual is saved, he cannot sin so as to ever be lost again. So God is doing everything and providing everything, providing faith, providing salvation. And he is the one who chose everyone who is saved according to Calvinism. And he did it even before he created the world. Their salvation then comes totally by grace. And not because of anything these sinners had done or would do. And once God determined their salvation, they could not possibly lose it 
How could one who really believes these errors not eventually become careless about his moral behavior? Theoretically, the way it should go is that the person who has been uh, selected and predestined by God to be saved will be so grateful that God selected him to be saved even before he was born that he will rejoice in that salvation and do the will of God. But, <laughs> that's theory. Then life happens. Well, let's say a business partner cheats somebody who believes in this and makes a hefty profit out of it. And he decides, well, why should I take that? So uh, he initiates a plan to retrieve all the money that his partner swindled him out of and more besides. If he can humiliate the thief, so much the better. His conscience might bother him at first, but hey, he's safe. Because once he has salvation, he can't lose it. Later, a younger female employee in the office catches his eye, and over a period of time, they become, uh, they, they have feelings for each other, and they begin to have an affair. And once again, his conscience bothers him at first, but as before, he realizes he can't really be lost, so the grace of God has been turned into lasciviousness, hasn't it? In fact, he's been taught that no matter what he does, he can't lose his salvation. So he divorces his wife of 30 years, marries her cute replacement, and goes off on a honeymoon to Las Vegas where the two of them drink and gamble the money he swindled his business partner out of. Well, hey, the other guy did it first. Doctrines that lead logically to such conclusions as these must be exposed for the error of they, uh, that they are. It is the grace of God allowing lasciviousness because the error is he can't lose his salvation so he can do anything he wants and he may well choose that course. Now Jude 4 says they deny the Lord Jesus. I don't believe this means that somebody stood up in the assembly and said, I deny that Jesus is the Son of God. I can't imagine anybody being that frivolous or uh, just that, uh, what's another word for stupid? A uh, foolish, okay. Uh, uh, I can't imagine anybody doing that and being that foolish. However, they denied Jesus by means of the logical consequences of their doctrine. If you accept their doctrine and follow it, it leads there. And in that way, they end up denying Jesus. Does Jesus teach his followers to engage in immoral activities? No. Then any kind of reasoning that ends up violating the holiness of God denies the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit who revealed truth to us. Jude, verses 5 through 7. One would almost think that Jude had been reading a Baptist manual because he immediately responds to the error of those who believe in once saved, always saved, and that they cannot lose their soul. His first illustration, and it was one that they well knew, concerns the Israelites whom God saved out of Egypt. Their glorious rescue did not prohibit, prohibit them from what? From unbelief. Hebrews 4.2 comments on the situation. For indeed the gospel was preached um, to them as well, or us to, as well as them. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Not being mixed with faith. As uh, in those who heard it. Yes, Israel did not enter into the promised land because of unbelief. The second illustration involves the angels in heaven. And if uh, any place ever existed where the operative rule would be once saved, always saved, you'd think it would be heaven. But it was not the case because many of the angels did not keep their proper domain. They left their own habitation. 
The description provided makes it clear that they are, in fact, lost without any uh, quibble whatsoever. Such ones God has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day, Jude 6. Peter began his description of them in this way, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be uh, reserved unto judgment, well, that's how he begins it. But if that's the case, then no one is safe who chooses sin. Third example, the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. They too had been saved by God through Abraham. Remember, they had been captured. This is not spiritual salvation. But they had been saved by Abraham and returned uh, to their land. But you know what? In all of that, they never considered repenting of their sins. Even though they had been dragged away and rescued by Abraham and returned, they never thought about repenting of their sins. If so, we don't have any account of it. God condemned the people of Sodom and Gomorrah because of their very grievous sin, Genesis 18.20, and it's obvious that most people in society today have never read Genesis 18.20. And that was because their practice was homosexuality. And it's also obvious that people have not read Genesis 19, verses 4 and 5. Jude said that they gave themselves over to fornication, King James, or sexual immorality, as many other translations have. In other words, homosexuality is included in the definition of porneia. He says they gave themselves over. We know what their sin was. It was homosexuality. That sin is called porneia. Now, a lot of people, some huh, alleged scholars, say that, oh, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. Yes, he did. Every time he used the word porneia, it was included. Amen. And uh, somebody is not a very good scholar if they don't know that because it's not hard to find. And it's not hard to figure out. Jude said that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That's what God thinks of homosexuality and those who refuse to repent of it. That sin saturates our current culture. All who practice and champion this sin shall join the Sodomites in eternal fire which is the reason we must speak out against it and every other type of immorality that the Bible defines while earnestly contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. There are some characteristics of uh, the people that uh, Jude is describing. They are sin-filtrators, as we might term them. They are dreamers of evil things, which reminds us what? Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. They reject authority, even gods, and speak evil of dignitaries who actually merit praise. Yes, such men speak evil concerning things of which they have little knowledge, Jude 8 through uh, the first part of verse 10. As Jesus foretold, these men probably look like sheep. In their demeanor, they may appear to be quite spiritual. And uh, they probably look like the Holy Spirit is very close to them, as though Christ is very close to them. But Jude takes away the facade so that all can see what lies behind it. And their spiritual knowledge is limited and of lesser importance to them. And what they know in the natural realm they have used like brute beasts for corruption. They are self-willed, filled with pride, like Cain, motivated by covetousness, as uh, Cain, uh, Balaam rather, and are rebellious as Korah. They cannot be characterized by anything noble or admirable. You just can't find anything. Fellowship with such men pollutes the purity of the body of Christ. Like brute beasts, they are also selfish, have no conscience, and have no fear of what is to come, though the Christian system clearly teaches that we shall all face the day of judgment. 
These men have no depth and are carried about by clouds of culture, speaking what is popular, saying what people want to hear. Their substance is so limited that they would be lucky to bring a sprinkle upon a dry land, let alone a deep and penetrating rain. They bear no good fruit and have so little spiritual life in them that they could be pulled up by the roots. That's what they're actually like. That's not what they may appear to be like. That's what they're actually like. They might be full of emotion, but they are only foaming up their own shame. Verses 12 and 13. Now just in case doubt remains in anyone's mind regarding the character of these men, Jude adds a few more descriptions. They are murmurers. They are complainers. They walk according to their own lusts. They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. For this reason, all must be on guard. They are good with the use of language, and their rationale sounds plausible, particularly when they praise those who are ready to follow them. Christians have been warned about mockers who walk after their own ungodly lusts. They are sensuous persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. Peter adds that they have eyes full of adultery, that they cannot cease from sin, that they beguile unstable souls. 2 Peter 2.14 All of their great swelling words of emptiness they use to allure through the lust of the flesh, through licentiousness, Christians who had actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. 2 Peter 2.18 and 19 How perverted to take those who have answered the call to holiness that comes through the gospel and lead them back into the ways of corruption. Christians today must contend earnestly for the faith by challenging and exposing such men as Peter and Jude did in the first century. Now let's talk very quickly about some applications. First of all, morality. Are there people of the kind of character described by Peter and Jude plaguing the Lord's church today? Yes. Several during the past five decades have taken it upon themselves to try to justify with great swelling words of emptiness unscriptural divorce and remarriage for just about any cause. Some have asserted that marriages prior to one becoming a Christian didn't count. Others have gone so far as to say, in effect, it doesn't matter if they were Christians or not. A Christian can divorce and remarry as many times as he wants and still go to heaven. They do verbal backbends, somersaults, and other contortions, even redefining the terms marriage and divorce to try to convince people that they are okay. No one seems to be promoting fornication as they do adultery in this case, but the majority of young couples in this country are living together prior to marriage. How many currently condemn that practice? They may not endorse it, but how many have actually condemned it? Brethren may not know when a couple is dating if they have committed fornication, but it's not much of a mystery when they move in together. We should be able to figure that out. Brethren do not just justify their arguments uh, with, uh, with uh, fornication, but they, do they speak out against it? They don't try to justify it, but do they speak out against it? And what are some of the more enlightened congregations doing with respect to homosexuality? They're still holding to the scriptures, right? No. I uh, heard this uh, last fall that a congregation in Texas uh, had a, quote, preacher who stood up and said, you know, it's time we changed our views on homosexuality. We're living in modern times, he said, and people have different alternative lifestyles than they once had. We ought to be more loving and more accepting of them. And after these great swelling words of emptiness, the congregation reportedly gave him a standing ovation showing that they're just as vacuous as he is. The world has made a tremendous impact on the Lord's church. As divorce has become more commonplace, church members have 
become inordinately affected by those things? How many who call themselves Christians also engage in fornication, homosexuality, drinking of alcoholic beverages, gambling, uh, wearing of immodest clothing, and so on? Perhaps we have not emphasized holiness as much as we should have, although I believe brethren have been doing so. And maybe we have not talked about what it means to be a Christian sufficiently, although I'm persuaded many faithful congregations have done precisely that. Or if we have done that, maybe the problem is is just not the message people want to hear. 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4. Faithful brethren must continue to contend for the faith on these moral issues. But what about doctrinal issues? Not every error that people believe involves immorality. The biggest problem in the first century was that of what? Judaizing teachers. These men promoted the error that those who became Christians had to keep the law of Moses. Gentiles obeying the gospel had to be circumcised according to them. None of these tenets involved encouraging anybody to commit an immoral act, did it? Yet, could anyone deny that Paul contended just as earnestly for the faith against these doctrinal errors as he did against moral errors? For some reason, many brethren appear to think that doctrinal issues do not matter all that much. They cannot get excited about such errors as reevaluation of elders or whether sinners are baptized in the Holy Spirit when they are immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Some just don't seem to be enthusiastic about the fact that those are errors at all. Who would have believed that the majority of brethren would have ever gone along with ideas that involved restructuring the church? A few years back. Who would have imagined that the very nature of worship would be altered with few brethren registering complaints? Profiles in Apostasy 1 and 2 both call attention to these successful efforts on the part of some brethren. But how many bought the books? And how many care about the analyses of these matters that are in them? Why do brethren not insist upon even clamor for truth? Is it too tedious to sift through the errors that false teachers propagate? Does that require too much? Do we feel that it's a useless and daunting task? The fact is that truth saves and error condemns. Those who have been guilty of mental laziness and sloppy reasoning need to repent. The Lord's church was once known for a people who practiced and cherished the scriptures and critical thinking. We were known as the people who took a stand and refused to back down. We were passionate about evangelism and truth. We were soldiers fighting the good fight of faith. We were known as the people of the book. When people had Bible questions, they came to us because they knew we had the answers. And yet... Things have changed. We need Bible curriculums that cover the entire Bible instead of the same stories over and over. We must master the key principles and know how to use the information the Bible gives us. We need men and women of conviction who will live by faith and spread the gospel locally and around the world. And we must all contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Have you been neglecting that? You need to repent. God needs men and women who will contend for the faith. If you have been lax in this, will you not repent this evening and begin to do that which God expects of you, which you find in the book of Jude? If you have not obeyed the gospel, you can't very easily contend for the faith because you're not a Christian yourself. If you know what you need to do, if you know about repentance, if you know about confessing that Jesus is the Son of God, if you know about being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, why not respond this evening? Jesus wants you in his kingdom. 
And he wants you to contend for the faith as a part of the kingdom. If you are ready to obey the gospel, we invite you to come. If you're not, please talk to one of the good brethren here, and they'll be glad to study further with you. But if we can help you now at this moment, come while we stand and while we sing.